Welcome to Learning Aloud, a podcast from the Organizational Dynamics Community at the University of Pennsylvania, produced to inspire purposeful leadership practice and transform organizational experience. I am your host, Stephen G. Hart. Lisa Cohn is an accomplished leadership consultant, executive coach, and keynote speaker. She has more than 25 years experience, including working with Fortune 500 clients in the areas of leadership, communication styles, managing change, interpersonal and team dynamics, strategy and execution. With her business partner, Robin McLeod, who lives in Mount Vernon, New York, they run Chatsworth Consulting based in Wayne, Pennsylvania. Most recently, Lisa released her personal memoir, To the Moon and Back, in which she recounts her turbulent childhood and upbringing in New York in the 1970s and her life as a Mooney. We'll explore that a little later in the podcast. Lisa, welcome to Learning Aloud podcast. Thank you for having me. I'd like to start talking about your first book written with your business partner, Robin McLeod, called The Power of Thoughtful Leadership, 101 Minutes to Being the Leader You Want to Be. Now, I really love this book. I've used it a lot in my own work and I refer to it often, even though it came out in 2012. Um, but I especially find myself using it when I'm faced with a new leadership challenge or simply when I need to remind myself of what good leaders need to do to stay on top of their game. What inspired you and Robin to write it? Well, it is a compilation of our, it used to be an e-zine and now it's a blog. Um, and we firmly believe in thoughtful leadership, which is being present, being intentional, and being authentic. And we know that life is going really fast. And so we like, we put out our Thoughtful Leaders Minute, our blog, and we give people a short snippet. Here's one way to stop for just a minute and think about who am I? How do I need to be here? What's my best self? How do I bring it? What do I need? And then we compile them. I am, um, we'll talk about my memoir later, but one of the things that helped me were those little daily readers where you could go in the back and be like, oh my God, how am I going to focus on this? Oh my, I have to think about feedback as a leader. I have to think about forgiveness. I have to think about self-care. I have to think about leading overall. And so we decided to design this as a daily reader where you could either just read through it or you could look for, what do I need right now to get me out of where I'm stuck? And so that's how we put it together. Yeah, wonderful. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's full of great advice um, and questions that you can ask yourself and, and I, I guess things that you can think about and take action on as a leader. And you and Robin identified eight major realms in there along with many associated thoughts and actions to be taken. What are those eight main realms, uh, and how do they work to help leaders to become the kind of leader they want to be? Sure. So the, the eight are to be present, to change and grow, to have freedom to fail, know yourself. We like to say awareness is the first step. Communicate and how to communicate with others. Appreciate, take action, and care for self. So we, I mean, we have thoughtful leadership, but then when life comes at you moment by moment, day by day, things happen. When we work with our clients and we live our own lives, we kind of saw these eight buckets as reminders that we needed or reminders that people needed, right? How can I actually be here and be in the moment, especially in this day with everything going on? How do I let myself fail and try things? Leaders are so driven to be perfect, to know everything, to make no mistakes, how do I let myself change and grow? How do I give myself that freedom? How do I give the people that work for me that freedom or the people I live with that freedom? Like I, we joked, I joked, awareness is the first step, but we really talk about when I know myself and I know what, how I come across well and how I call it my evil twin or like my slip is showing with the things I do that just get in the way, right? Or when I know what I need to be okay. I was working with a client the other day and they said something like this, this, and this, and I know I needed this, this, and this to feel better. And I'm like, yeah, you, right? Because if we could all think about what do I need in this moment? Um, appreciation. I talk a lot about appreciation, about you get what you focus on. And um, if you look at the world and you see what's right, it's one way to help you have a better day and be a better person and be a better leader. There, you know, the whole gratitude, this concept, it, it actually works, right? And if I look for three things that went well today, I open my eyes, I literally open my peripheral vision and I see more opportunity. And then if I add to it how I helped it to happen, I have self-efficacy. Um, so there, that, so looking at what's right, looking for what's right in a person who I can't connect with, that kind of stuff. And then 
actually doing something, taking action. So it's not all thinking and pondering, but it's actually how am I going to move forward? What am I going to do? And then we underline all of it with self-care. I, I generally, with all my clients, one of the last things I say is, and how are you going to take care of yourself, right? Because life is hard, to quote Scott Peck. And so how do I fill up my tank so that I can show up in my best self? So those are just kind of things I've learned to live by and we see with our clients and we see what they need. So leadership is can be quite heady and theoretical, but it also can be quite practical in how am I just going to do my best right here. Mm. It's almost like you're in, inspiring people to change habits or break a habit. Yeah, to be aware of a habit, yeah. right? So yeah, really, like really with my clients, I when they get to the point where they'll say, oh, and then I noticed that I did that, I'm like, yeah. And then maybe next time you'll notice just before you're going to do it, yeah. right? <laughs> or, you know, and then maybe you'll notice and you won't do it, right? And then what are you going to do instead, right? And how are you going to change that? So it's, it's about awareness and then it's about small little steps to, to change, right? To change to be where you want to go. Yeah. So where do you want to go? Where are you now? And then what are the steps that are going to take you there? Right. So the subtitle of the book is 101 Minutes. Uh, what's the significance of the 101? 101. 101 uh, kind of made up. So we like, we wanted to compile them. We wanted a good number. We like, we wanted to be meaty enough, but not too much. Um, and, you know, an hour just didn't seem enough. So 101 was just like a let's compile, that's a good number to offer people when they can read. I have people, strangers, clients who've read all the way through it, page by page. And like I said, I have people just kind of go and pull it out when they need to see something. But it, you know, we could probably do 101 more and then 101 more after that. We thought about doing the next steps. Um, it really was just a, how can we package this to make it easy for people, right? The whole change is hard, leadership is hard, we're all too busy, we don't have time for everything. How can we make, you know, leadership that, again, being present, being intentional, being authentic, how can I make it simple and easy for people to understand and do? So that's So it wasn't because you have a, a love of the 101 Dalmatians? Could be. Okay. Could be. I'm a <laughs> consultant and a coach. I'm like, yeah, that's exactly it. No, that's not why. It's a good idea, though. <laughs> well, you know, a theme that comes through very clearly for me in the book is that looking at the, at the list of things that you have there, that pretty much anybody can do this as long as you have an openness to learning. Yes. So... And that's kind of the authentic part, right? So I am a leadership consultant. I teach leadership skills. I teach management skills. I teach every kind of inter and interpersonal skill just about and style and approach and lots of tools. But we all need to find the way to do it as ourselves, right? And that's what I say to clients all the time. Like, if you go and just do this because I taught you this model, but it's not true to you, people are going to know you don't mean it. So it's really about here are best practices how do I do it in a way that's authentic? And and I can have, you know, an evil twin in a lot of ways, you know, a, a flaw or a, a way I behave in a lot of ways, but I can shift, right? We really, it really is possible. I say to people that our brain is this muscle, it's not really muscle, and I know that, but it's this muscle that we don't use, right? We think our brain controls us, but the reality is we can control our brain more. So, you know, I had someone say to me many years ago, like, you can't be responsible for how you react, how you feel about something. You can be responsible for then how you think about it and what you do about it, right? So I may have a behavior that I've done. I have a, a client I work with for years and he yelled. He yelled a lot. I know why he yelled. I know where it came. Like we could trace why, how he learned that growing up and how he learned that growing up in his, in his adult working life. He could just say, I'm a yeller, or he could say, I'm a yeller, and here's how I'm going to stop, or here's how I'm going to let people know, or here's how I'm going to mitigate it. So it's, you know, it's owning how you show up, but yes, anybody can make their life better or make their leadership better. That's what I believe. Yeah. So other than the yeller, what other kinds of transformations have you seen among your clients without giving names? Oh, gosh. I am, I'm so blessed as a coach and, and as a consultant to work with clients because I've seen, so I've seen people, like I, I like to say, there's this evil twin, right? So there's this, all these great sides of me. And then to every person who has all these great sides, there's that you do it too much and, right? And so I've seen the, the yeller or the people who quote unquote leave dead bodies in the wake with their directness, if you will, learn to stop and go, oh, what is what does Lisa need right now for me? What does Steve need for me right now? I had a a client who had someone who worked for her who needed too much help. Um, but so my client literally put in her calendar once a week a reminder to go give that person 
a little bit of positive feedback. And that person soared, right? And so, and I've had, I had a client who um, had a not good reaction in a work situation. And, you know, this, this kind of trigger one here, literally we, we were talking about a lot of stuff and, and it came out in the midst of our coaching that this, this client had been date raped many years ago. And this is not therapy, but we were able to say, that that happened to you, how might that be affecting how you're able to trust people here in the work environment? And how can you, how can you be trusting when you absolutely learned not to trust, right? I, I work with a lot of clients on many of our quote unquote negative behaviors are really something inside us thinking it's protecting us or saving us. So how do you say to that voice that's screaming, don't trust or yell or you won't be heard or don't say anything or you'll get in trouble that you learned somewhere from your first boss or something when you were in school, right? How do you say to that voice, no, no, it's okay. I can do this behavior, right? How do you help yourself through that? So I'm, I'm graced to see clients do a lot of those things. Yeah, it's great. So you and, <clears throat> you and Robin do this under the, the banner of Chats with Consulting. Yes. Um, so how did you and Robin meet? Now, if you know Robin, that's even a better story. So Robin and I met. Uh, I got my MBA in Columbia's executive program a fair amount of time ago. And I was, they gave us math camp. Before they started the MBA program, they gave us math camp so they could teach us how to do math again. And I'm on the subway on the way up, and I see this woman sitting across the subway uh, car from me, and she's going over the notes, as Robin likes to say, of the things She's doing it then, and I had done it like a week beforehand, but she's doing it on the way up to math camp. And I go up and I'm like, hi, are you going to Columbia? <laughs> and she goes, yeah, who are you? <laughs> and it turned out she was in my program, and she actually lived in the building that I was moving into in a month. Um, and so we went to the program, and we became steadfast friends. And I started the company. I founded the company in 1995, and then in about 2002, two or three, she was really unhappy in the job she was in. And she kept saying, I kept saying to her, you need to go out on your own. You need to go out on your own. And she finally, she called me up. She's like, can we talk? And she comes, o- she comes over and she says, why would I go out on my own when we could actually work together? And I like to say, I have my Sally Field moment. I'm like, oh, I have something someone wants to join. They like me. <laughs> like, they really like me. And so she joined in 2003 and we've been best friends and business partners ever since. She's the yin to my yang, the tall to my short, the African American to my Caucasian, the like the opposite, the quiet to my loud. We're like it's we're a great partnership. Yeah, it is great, and and uh, you know you've done some great work in this area. I'm personally aware of a lot of that. In a very crowded field, how do you and Robin differentiate your services? So yes, and I'm a consultant, so I get to say yes, and I have learned that there is more than enough work for everyone in a world of abundance, so I don't have to beat out every other consultant and coach. That said, I do think there are ways we set ourselves apart. Um, We, um, so one, uh, everyone in our team, because we have other people come and work with us, are both consultants and coaches. So we approach all of our consulting work, whether it's training and, you know, or facilitation or consulting around this work, from a coach's point of view, and a coach, a coach mindset is that our clients have their answers, and my job is just to ask questions, hold up a mirror, be curious, and so we we work in that way, right? Um, and then also as coaches, there are some coaches who will just only ask questions, but we are leadership experts, so we will say, and here's a best practice, and here's a way to do it, and here's three models you can try, and here's five articles you can read. So we. We, so we do we do both of those. We we come from the coaching curiosity, but we offer all the expertise we have over twenty something years of doing this. Right? Um, we everyone on our firm has actually worked, so actually been in the trenches, worked, led, managed, worked for people, managed other people. So we speak from expertise and personal experience as well. Um, we especially probably mostly me in the firm, but we all do this whole person view, right? We have a a 360, you know, the leadership circle profile, which really gives you a a picture of that whole person, right? Because we've both with individuals as coaches and with organizations, we firmly believe you got to look at the behaviors and what's happening, but you have to look at the underlying beliefs and assumptions and thought processes or systems and processes that are getting in the way. And so if you, if you can't, if you just, uh, you know, address what's on top, you're dealing with the symptoms, but you're not dealing with the causes. So we really do go whole 
We ask tough questions. We're willing to have our clients get mad at us. We, we, I'm, I will always say, I may not be right, but this is what I see. What do you think? Like, and so we kind of do that whole sense. And then the fourth thing, um, and I do know this is different because I've had clients tell me it's different. We flex to the client. So we do in our coaching, in our consulting work, we do have specific processes and systems and way we do things, but my goal is to provide value to the client. So if, you know, if we're in front of a room and we, they've agreed on the agenda and we're going this way and all of a sudden you read the room and you're thinking, pause, you actually want to go that way. We will take five and go the other way. Um, and with a coaching client, there, again, there's a process we follow, but every time it, it's about what is this client, where are they right now, what do they need right now, and how do I show up and give that to them versus you have to go through this process. I had a, a client recently and he spent a, a good portion of his hour-long phone call kind of venting. And I'm like, and I all call it out. I'm like, you know, venting all the time is not coaching. Do you need to vent? Is this moving you? Or do you need to vent and then can we go somewhere, right? So you, it's about showing up where the client is, knowing where they want to get and how can you help them get there, but where they are versus having a set, and, and I've been told, I'm like, doesn't every coach show up that way? And I've been told, no, they don't, no. right? So I really do no. flex to my right. clients. I, I love what I, you know, what I've experienced from it is the idea of the holistic approach to things yeah. that you bring to it. And it kind of brings me to my next point about the, the new memoir <laughs> to some extent. So let's shift gears a little bit and talk about the, the, the other the, side of Lisa. the new memoir, like the other side of Lisa. Yeah, your memoir is called To the Moon and Back. Yes. And uh, in this book, uh, you recount that uh, turbulent childhood and upbringing in the New York in the 70s and your life as a Mooney, mm-hmm. right, which is intriguing. And uh, I, I didn't know that until I read the book. <laughs> Most uh, but, people don't. Yeah. <laughs> but, but what did you want to say by writing this book? Um, so as we were talking before, I, I did make myself quite vulnerable with this book. And I've had many clients, many like people in my neighborhood and clients say to me, I had no idea, to which I say, why would you have known? Your work was about you. I wouldn't say, oh, and when I was a Mooney. And for those of you who don't know, Moonies are the Unification Church. They were the cult of all cults in the 70s and 80s, Reverend Samuel Moon, Big Mass Weddings. The The line I like to use for that side of my life is the, the best seats I ever had at Madison Square Garden were at my mother's wedding because my mom got married with 2,075 other couples in Madison Square Garden, and I had floor seats, only time ever. And then the other side of my life, please excuse me, is the best cocaine I ever had was for my father's friend, the judge, because my dad was sex, drugs, and squalor in New York City's East Village in the 70s. So it was a interesting upbringing that I don't share unless it's truly appropriate with a client. And now I share it with everybody. And so when I think about why the heck did I do this? So I do have three messages I'm trying to get across. One is that extremist situations are very prevalent that whether they're religious cults or extreme religions that you may not call cults or political groups or terrorist groups and gangs, they're very prevalent now. They're even more prevalent now because the internet makes it easier to grab people and they are extremely dangerous. There is nothing more intoxicating than knowing you have the truth, even if it's not true. When you believe in that way, you will do absolutely anything and people die because of this, right? So. They are there, and I want people to know that they're there. It's intoxicating. It can happen to anybody, and how do you stay out, get out, get someone out, know that it's there? The second message is um, for anyone who feels that they are hopeless or damaged beyond repair. Um, My story, I mean, a lot of people have a worse story than I do, but my story, I come out of my childhood still at times feeling damaged beyond repair. I can, those are scars. Those are scars in my brain and my psyche from what happened to me. And I want people who feel hopeless to know that there is hope, that there is a way, like that there, I shouldn't be as happy as I am. And there is a way to find hope and release and ease. And, you know, I, I still get messages from people I know and people I don't know on um, through the internet saying, thank you for, you know, telling your story. I know, I know I'm not the only one, you know, I can see the, the positive and what I'm getting out of this. So, so that, so I'm trying to spread a message of hope and love because I've rebuilt my life through hope and love. And then the third is both in my personal life, uh, my upbringing and in my work as a coach, I think as a species, we are all so hard on ourselves. We are self-critical and self lambasting and self-judging and and we just need a huge dose of self-compassion and self-love and I I preach it I, I before I wrote the book I would preach it in corporate terms and now that 
I've outed myself in many ways, even with my clients, I can say, well, you know where this comes from. And I, and I still preach it in corporate terms, but I can also preach it in, in whole person terms, right? A lot of my clients, I'm like, what are you going to do to take care of yourself? You're in a really tough situation. And yes, we can talk about how to handle the situation, but we also have to talk about how you're not going to hate yourself for being in this situation because that's not going to help you. So <clears throat> those are my messages. Well, that, that's, that's the connection it made for me because I've known you a while. Uh, but there were two things from the, the surprises that I took from the reading of the book. The first one is how incredibly emotional and open you are in sharing your story. <laughs> and second is how that emotion and openness really helped me to see why you are such a great coach. Thank you. Um, I can see how that ability to empath you know, empathize with others, uh, read a situation, help people find the best version of themselves, was really formed during these trials and tribulations that you experienced as a child. Um, and by what you've learned from your association. You, were you consciously aware that you were doing that, though, when you wrote this book, or was it more of a sense of just let me just get this story out and see where it goes? I don't think I really put two and four together <laughs> to get anything, right? Okay. I don't. I um, so Just committed to doing I it. Just, yeah, so the story goes, uh, many years ago, if you read the book, I crawled into Al-Anon. I um, was engaged to be married to someone who drank a heck of a lot, and it was not fun. Um, and so I crawl into the rooms and, uh, as my brother likes to say, when you sit in this room of like 10, 20, 30, 50 people who have really hard lives and you tell your story and everybody's jaw drops and looks at you and goes, oh my God, you should write a book. Well, that's what happens right. when we tell our story. You're like, wow. <laughs> You're like, oh, I knew it was weird, but I didn't know it was bad. Um, so I started 20 years ago writing a half memoir, half self-help book, because I was a coach. Like, here's what happened. Here's how it messed me up. Here's how I got better. You can too, because I was going to help people with it. And um, and I got wonderful rejections, many of which said, this is wonderful. You're a great writer, great story. You are not famous enough to famous enough to write a hybrid. Where will they put you in Barnes & Noble? You can't do this. And in about 2010, an agent wrote to me and or called me and said, if you write a memoir, I'll represent you. So I just sat down and I wrote it. And I like to write. I like telling a story. I like the editing. I am creative. It was fun. And I just poured it all out and spent years, well, by the time I finished, she couldn't take me on, years refining it and editing it and getting help and looking for a way to publish it. And so it was just this, like, it just became a, you know, my my husband used to call me LK Rowling because I just, I would get rejected and <laughs> and then go back again. And I just kept going and right. going and going. And it just became a, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. And then it happened, and I went, oh, my God, what the heck did I do? Because I don't, I don't think I stopped to realize how absolutely honest and vulnerable I was about not just what happened to me as a child, but then what happened from my, like, teenage years on when I did all the really, I mean, I, I almost jumped off a bridge. I became anorexic. I developed a, somewhat of a mild cocaine addiction. I, you know, we were in these really bad relationships, and I had a lot of... I put all the crazy, weird, self-lambasting thoughts in my head out in the book. And I don't think I realized that I'd really done that until one, I started getting, again, wonderful emails from people. Thank you for telling your story and giving us all courage to tell our story. And thank you for letting me know I'm not alone. And then, and then I, you know, then I would, like, I met a new client and he downloaded the book. And then I got an email three weeks later, like, work, 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 P.S., going to be really interesting to work with you. And I'm like, oh my gosh, what do I, like these, I'm in front of the room and these people are going, oh, she did this when she was 18 and she thought that. And, <laughs> you know, and every time I think, what the heck did I do? I think, I think of what you posted on LinkedIn, right? Now I'm able to say, yeah, it was crazy. And I did really stupid stuff, right? And this is how I got better. And, and some of it will help you. And I'm able, I mean, if you, if you know me and you know my past, and you know my work, they really are in tandem. And now I can be just more transparent about why everything in the thoughtful leaders, you know, the power of thoughtful leadership is a lot of it is because of what I had to do for me to heal from what I went through. So it's a, it's been quite a journey. Yeah. Well, it, I think it also makes you more authentic as yeah. a coach, but yeah. uh, you've given us a great gift uh, with, with this book. And um, in addition to Megan Kelly and now the learning aloud, le learning aloud podcast, uh, it, you've, you've been to some interesting places uh, yeah. since the publication. So yeah. tell us some of the places you've been and what what's this experience been for you? Oh, I've uh, I've been on well, I've been on Israeli TV and Russia Today News, which have been fascinating. And I will actually tell you that Russia Today News was one of the best interviews. I don't know who saw it because they actually asked me. 
how do people get into it? How can people get out of it? How can you help people who are in it? Practical right? advice. Really practical yeah, advice right. versus, oh my God, your mother this and yeah, right. Reverend Moon that, which is wonderful and fascinating. Right. Um, I My book tour included Ann Arbor, Michigan, Minneapolis, Minnesota, Cleveland, Ohio, Charlotte, North Carolina, Woodstock, New York, Amherst, Massachusetts, and a bunch of other places I, you know, went to the wrong airport one day on the way to someplace. I, you know, I did a lot of really silly things. It was a lot in a lot in a couple of weeks. Um, I didn't know where I was. Um, and then for each one of those readings, I would, well, first I would leave my book fairy book in the airport because that's an important thing to do because I'm trying to spread a message and get everyone to see it. Um, but then I would, I read a, a couple of sections, um, some very intense, intense for me to read it and I think intense for people to hear. And then I answer questions. And what do you know? People have a lot of questions about what it's like to be in a cult and what it's like to have a Messiah and what it's like. And then my dad's side. And I'll, yeah, so people are, so it's been, it's been amazing. It's been wonderful. It's been incredibly hard. The first, the first few readings I did, I'm like, why am I so drained? Because I, I literally open my whole being and heart. And then people ask me really personal questions and I do my best to answer them. So it's, it's been exciting and wonderful. I've had conversations I never thought I'd have with people. I found people I never thought I'd find. If you Google me, I'm like on the first five pages on Google. It's a very <laughs> weird experience. Um, but I keep going. I'm doing this for a reason. I'm doing this. I'm doing this to help people. So, yeah. yeah. You certainly are. So what's next for you? That is a good question. I am. Um, Not back to normal, right? Yeah. I don't think there is any normal anymore. <laughs> I am. Um, yeah. I am. Uh, being that it's going into the holiday season, I'm in January. I'm figuring out where I'm going to go next. I'm open. I'll go anywhere, just about anywhere, like where I'm going to go next for a book reading, what are the next ways to keep it going, and what's the next thing I'm going to write, what do I want to write, I love to write and I love to edit, and then also how can I, how can I keep the memoir and my work, how can I mold them more, because like you said, it is, it's, I've always, I think I've always been authentic, and now I'm actually hmm. able to be like, yes, I am, right? You can explain right? why. And I can explain <laughs> why, right? Because normally if I would tell my story, it literally can suck energy out of the room. Everyone's like, oh my gosh, right? So yeah. now it's out there, and we can just talk about it versus me having to shock people with it. Right. So it's trying to figure out how to keep, keep making a difference and keep putting the word out there to see if I can touch more lives. Well, thanks for sharing that story with us. And Thank you. Especially stopping by our studio today, at, at sharing your... Uh, life and work as well. <laughs> it's been a great pleasure to have you on the podcast today. Thanks for coming by. Thank you, Steve. It's great to be here.